Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to part three of System Disruptor. We are in an impromptu series. I say impromptu because it started three weeks ago. Today, um, just out of the blue, I didn't know this was going to be an actual series, but I started reading about the life of Hezekiah, one of the kings of Judah, and it turned into a three-part, which actually is going to be a four-part series. Next week should be our last sermon in this series, but it has just been so good. Week after week, God has been showing us some incredible things in his words. So I'm excited today to bring to you part three of System Disruptor. The title is Identifying, Identifying the Spirit of Sennacherib. But I want to just open up in a word of prayer today, and I want to ask you to open up your heart to receive whatever God wants to deposit in you today through his word. So Father, we just come before you today asking God that you would use me as your vessel today to speak your word. Lord, you know exactly what your people have need of, God. I don't know, but you know. Every person watching, whether they're watching live or, or watching the archive after the fact, Lord, I pray that this word would minister to them, God, that they would find peace in your word, Lord. Father, that they would hear these things, God, and that it would bring them relief in many ways, God, to those who have been tormented, to those who have been depressed, to those who have been sad. Father, I pray that this would just uplift your people today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So I wanna welcome everybody that's tuning in live. Today's a little bit of a different format. I'm sitting on a couch with a background. It's a little bit more chill. So I wanna ask you to just take a moment right now and share this video with somebody, someone who may need encouragement, someone that you think could use this word today. Maybe you just wanna share it on your profile for anybody who comes across your newsfeed. This is a way that we can spread the gospel. So just take a moment right now and share this word as we jump in. I wanna recap before I get into today's message, uh, what we learned in last week's message. So there were four points. Who in the room right now remembers my four points from last week for a $25 Dunkin' gift card? I was going to say Starbucks gift card. You got 10 seconds. I was going to say Starbucks gift card. Don't read them either. But this group doesn't seem to like Starbucks. Every single week they come in here with Dunkin'. So 10, 9, 8. Okay, go ahead. All right, so Justin's um, got them. When you, I think, I think I got them. So it's being under siege is not being uh, defeated. Okay, that was good. And then it's, Spirit of Astro will try to relocate you. Okay. Because, you know, the directing from God. Yes. Place. Wow, you didn't look at these? No. Okay. No, I, well, I mean, I, I looked at them when I was doing the video. Okay. Um, and come on, I know this. There's two more, right? Um, there's, oh, what was the third one? What was the third one? Yeah, yeah. All right, so he said first, there's a difference between being laid, laid or being under siege and something overtaking you, right? That was point number one. Number two was the Asherah spirit will always try to relocate you, so you're two for four. Two for four. The third one is, oof, this one isn't going to get me. $25 Dunkin' gift card, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that buys you at least two and a half coffees. <laughs> Actually, no, that's Starbucks. Dunkin' will get you a long way with 25 You know what? I, I don't think All right, we got to roll. We got to roll. That's okay. That's okay. I think they will have learned their lesson by next week. I keep offering gift cards for coffee every time someone can remember my point. So here are the four. You ready? There's a difference between laying siege to something and overtaking something. And we were talking about how the king of Israel, Hosea, had been attacked by the king of Assyria, but they laid siege to Israel. However, they did not overtake Israel in the city of Samaria until three years later. So you may feel in your life like you're under attack. You may feel like the enemy is overtaking you, but just to lay siege to something means to cut off its resources. It does not mean that you are being overtaken. So the devil may be trying to cut off your resources, but you're not overtaken yet. Number two, the Asherah spirit will try to relocate you. The, the devil wants you to get out of your home field advantage. So whenever God tells you to do something, you have to stick with what God says, not with what the grass looks greener on the other side. You have to stick with what God says. 
Number three, be careful who you are in, plo- in close proximity to. Now, this was, this was the one Justin couldn't get. This was in reference to Judah, right? King Hezekiah and his proximity to Israel. The fact that they were under attack, their very enemies then eventually made their way to Judah and attacked Hezekiah, which, we're, which is what we're going to talk about today. Number four, the Asherah spirit will always make you think you did something wrong. And that's what the devil is a genius at. He convinces you that you did something wrong and that you are somehow deserving of the hardship or the difficulty that you're facing. So those were the four points from last Sunday's message. But I want to pick up today in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 14 through 16, as we continue to look at the life of this system disruptor, Hezekiah. It says, King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I have done wrong. There it is again, right? It always tries to make you think you did something wrong. I will pay whatever tribute money you demand if you will only withdraw. The king of Assyria then demanded a settlement of more than 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold to gather this, to, to gather this amount. King Hezekiah used all of the silver stored in the temple of the Lord and in the palace treasury. Hezekiah even stripped the gold from the doors of the temple and from the doorpost he had overlaid with gold. He then gave it all to the Assyrian king. So here we are, right? We, we, we learned that Hezekiah in week one was a system disruptor. He was one of the few kings of Judah that did what God wanted him to do, that obeyed and adhered to the commands of the Lord. But not only that, he tore down all of these Asherah poles, the idols, all of the, the altars of, the, of these false gods. So he was not only obedient, but he was also a system disruptor. And this was the whole origin of this, of this sermon series was talking about people who not only do what is pleasing to God, but disrupt the system that is contrary to the will of God in an organization, in your own life, in a church. There are system disruptors that God is raising up everywhere. And so that's what Hezekiah is. He's a system disruptor. We're looking at his life. But here, here we see something peculiar that took place. The Assyrian king is now laying siege on on Judah and King Hezekiah is reacting in a way that is not consistent with a system disruptor. He's going back to the sin of his father and clinging to materialism and offering this king of Assyria money in exchange. Again, he's, he's in essence trying to recreate the earthly contract that he had broken, the agreement that he had broken between Assyria by saying, hey, let's be allies again and let's not fight. Here's the money that you asked for. But that is, again, not the nature of a system disruptor. What he needed to do was stand his ground and trust in God who had not failed him up until that point that God would get him out of the difficult circumstances that he was in. Instead, he fell back into the, the, the pattern and the sin of his father Ahaz. But God is gracious. 2 Kings 18, 17 through 18 says, Nevertheless, everybody say nevertheless. nevertheless. Nevertheless, type it in the chat. Nevertheless, the king of Assyria sent his commander in chief, his field commander and his chief of staff from Lachish with a huge army to confront the king or to confront King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. The Assyrians took up a position beside the aqueduct that feeds water into the upper pool near the road leading to the field where cloth is washed. They summoned King Hezekiah, but the king sent these officials to meet with him. Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, some weird names, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the royal historian. Now, my first point this morning is when you negotiate with the enemy, there will always be a nevertheless clause. Nevertheless. Again, if we look at verse 17, the Bible says that King Hezekiah gave the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, what he demanded. Nevertheless, the king of Assyria sent his commander in chief and his field commander. So, so here we see King Hezekiah is giving him what he asked for. He's giving the enemy the very thing that he demanded. Nevertheless, the enemy attacked anyway. See, the devil's really crafty and he's really good at making you believe that he'll honor his word. But the whole basis for the enemy's uh, uh, missions that he launches against us is deception. 
Deception is at the core of everything the devil does because he is the father of all lies. So he may try and convince you, hey, comply with me and I'll protect you. Comply with me and I'll give you what you ask for. Nevertheless, he won't honor what he said. Hezekiah gave the enemy what he wanted. Nevertheless, he still decided to attack them. So let me break this down in a real practical way. The devil doesn't want to just make you depressed. There's constant, uh, there's constant dialogue that happens in our minds. And many times we think that it's our own thoughts, but it's not. These are thoughts that are sent to us by the enemy. And we, we have to learn how to handle these thoughts, get rid of these thoughts and not entertain these thoughts because the devil may, may be trying to, to make you depressed in your mind, make you depressed in, in, in your spirit, in your heart. But he doesn't want to just stop there. And so you can't negotiate with the enemy. He wants to not just make you depressed, but he wants you to ultimately end up taking your own life. He wants to put inside of you suicidal thoughts because the whole mission of the devil is to destroy what God is trying to build. That's what he's after. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your legacy. He wants to destroy the plan that God has for your life. And he won't stop with just depression, with just anxiety. He doesn't want you to just have a porn addiction. He wants you to end up having an affair and your, your, your marriage to be broken into pieces. Like the devil doesn't want to just stop at one thing. And so the idea that we can give the devil an inch and that's where he'll remain and he won't wreak havoc on the rest of our lives is not accurate. The devil wants to destroy us. He is after our lives. He is after your soul. So we can't negotiate with him. He doesn't want to just uh, get you to throw in the towel on what God is calling you to do. He wants you to abandon the call altogether so that your legacy, your children will not be able to do what God has called them to do. The devil is after everything, everything. So we can't negotiate with him. We have to cast him out. We have to push him out, right? Because there will always be a nevertheless clause in whatever it is that the devil is trying to uh, get you to agree with, get you to believe. There will be a nevertheless. And that's what we see here with Hezekiah. He, he thought that by paying the devil what he wanted, or paying uh, Sennacherib, the spirit used by the devil, he thought by giving that king what he wanted, the king of Assyria, that the king would then retract and say, okay, we're in, we're in unity again. But something had happened prior to all of this. Hezekiah had already disrupted the system. And so there's a progression to things. The devil has, like I was talking about last week, principalities. He has servants that he uses for the destruction of God's people. But again, there's a progression to things. We talked about Asherah, the spirit of Asherah, all these Asherah poles that, that, that were places of worship to this false deity, this false goddess, right? And, and Hezekiah comes in and destroys all of that and says, no, we're not doing that. We're going to serve God. And so then the king of Assyria comes in, he starts to attack. And what happens? The Bible says that Hezekiah gives him what he wants. Nevertheless, the king continued anyway. So now we see that the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, is starting to engage in the same uh, battle plan, the same strategy as his predecessor, King uh, Shalmaneser of Assyria. He began to besiege them, right? But it took three years for Assyria to overtake Israel. And now King Sennacherib is starting the same process. You see, the king of Assyria was under the same influence of the same spirit. I'm calling it the spirit of Sennacherib because that was the name of the king that was coming against him. But as I was talking about last week, the devil uses principalities. He uses strongholds. He uses uh, his servants to assert and to, to, to uh, carry out missions against God's people. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. There are strongholds um, that are built by the enemy all over the world where he has these principalities that govern, govern, they rule and they reign. And so that's what we see at work here in the, in the form of the spirit of Asherah, right? In the form of the spirit of Sennacherib. These are principalities of darkness that the enemy uses to weaponize against us. Second Kings 18 through 18 verses 19 through 25. It says, then the, king, the Assyrian king's chief of staff told them to give this message to Hezekiah. 
This is what the king of Assyria says. So now the king of Assyria is moving in and this is what he says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on that you have rebelled against me? On Egypt? If you lean on Egypt, you will be like a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable. But, but perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship, worship only at the one altar here in Jerusalem? I'll tell you what, strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many men to ride on them. With your tiny army, how can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops? Even with the help of Egypt's chariots and charioteers. What's more, do you think we have invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. Now, the devil is a master negotiator. See, we see that the devil's negotiating his terms here. Did God, you know, when we think about the devil's negotiation tactics, this isn't something that he just started perfecting. This isn't something that he just started working on. You have to think back to the Garden of Eden. I mean, at the beginning of time, at the beginning of creation, that serpent was already starting to work on and perfect his negotiation skills. Think about it with Adam and Eve. Did God really say you can't eat any of the fruit in this garden? Look at this luscious garden. Look at all of the things that it has to offer. And God is so rude. He wouldn't even let you partake of these. No, no, no. The devil has been negotiating since day one. He's a master negotiator. And that's what we see here through the form of this principality called Sennacherib, this, this spirit that comes and taunts. And let me tell you something. This spirit is not just limited to biblical times. Spirits don't die. They live on forever. You and I have spirits inside of us that are not gonna die. We're gonna live forever. When we die in this carnal mortal body, our spirit will live on either with God or away from God for eternity. And let me tell you something, eternity is a long time, but the spirit inside of you will never die. You will either spend eternity in paradise with God or you'll spend eternity in, in, in a place very contrary to paradise away from God. And the choice is ours. But I said that to say that spirits do not die. They live on forever. And so the spirits that were at work at this time, the strongholds, the principalities that were at work in the garden of Eden, Satan himself, his spirit lives on. This, this spirit of Sennacherib, this spirit of Asherah that we talked about last week, it's not dead. It's alive. It goes by different names, but it's important that we as Christ followers study the word of God so that we can see the patterns and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, identify these, uh, these, these opposing spirits and understand their tactics and reveal what they do behind the scenes to try and discourage us as Christ followers. There's a very entertaining book and the title is Never Split the Difference by an author named Chris Voss. He was a FBI negotiator, hostage negotiator. He would go into the most difficult of situations and negotiate the release of hostages. And so he wrote this book called Never Split the Difference. That's a business book. It's a, business, it's a book on, on how to negotiate, how to conduct business and never split the difference. And he talks about how you cannot afford to give the, the offender what they are requesting. Somehow, some way, you have to get into the mind of this person and using these tactics of negotiation, you have to actually convince them that your desired outcome was their idea. It's an incredible art. I remember when I first got the book, I started reading it and I started practicing it because he talked about how the, he and his team are able to negotiate upgrades on their rooms at hotels when they go and travel. So they can go into a hotel with an economy baseline room. And through these tactics of negotiation, they speak with you know, whoever's checking them into the room and they end up getting upgraded. And he talks about how his son is part of their team and up, gets upgraded to like the penthouse suite whenever they go and they're traveling all over. And so I decided I wanted to try these techniques that he was teaching in the book and put them into, into action. And sure enough, it was 
several times that I went to a hotel and I used these techniques and I got my room upgraded. Or I was, I was talking to somebody about some item I wanted to purchase and I used these negotiating ta- techniques and I was able to get more out of the deal. And so the devil never splits the difference. He's a master negotiator. He's better than Chris Voss. He has learned over the years how to perfect the art of negotiation. And that's what he does with us. He negotiates with us. He tries to persuade us into doing what we should not do, what we know in our hearts is not right. And he uses a spiritual hierarchy system. Did you know that the devil is all about systems? The devil is an excellent administrator. He's excellent at building systems. Just look at the systems of this world, many of which were built by the devil many of which were built by his servants, by these principalities. He's excellent. He's very efficient at what he does. Why are you talking about the devil, Pastor David? Why are you giving him praise? No, we need to study what he does so that we know how to come against it. We need to study what he does so that we know how to stand strong. When he uses these tactics and techniques, he's very sneaky. He flies under the radar. And I think the problem with many churches that don't want to talk about the enemy and the strategies that he uses against us, they say, well, we're not gonna give glory to the devil. We're not gonna, we're just gonna talk about God. We're just, no, no, no. You have to understand the techniques and the tactics that he uses or else he'll come in and deceive you. And that's what he does in many people and in many churches. But he uses a spiritual hierarchy system with principalities and, 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 and there, are, there are different levels of authority in his kingdom. There are the principalities of darkness. These are governing forces, like I was talking about, that govern over regions that have domain and rule over certain parts of, of, of the world. Have you ever noticed when you're driving through certain areas, it may be through, through the city, it may be through different places, you can feel certain things about that environment? New age people will say, oh, well, that's the energy. You're feeling the energy. There's either positive energy, there's either negative energy. And and, and while they are onto something there, yes, that you're feeling a source of energy, what you're actually feeling is, is spiritual activity. You can drive through a region. You can drive through a county. You can drive through, you can cross the border from one state into another and suddenly you get a different feeling. Have you ever had that happen before where you're driving in the US and you're crossing over into another state and it feels different? I mean, just as soon, it's the exact same real estate plane. It's the exact same environment, but something happens as soon as you cross the border from one state into another, you feel something different. And I can think of several states in mind that you cross over, you're like, ooh, I felt something. Why? Because you just entered into a different governing system. You just entered into a different place where, where different principalities have different hierarchies and different ways of operating and, and different legislation in the spirit realm. This is real, folks. We have to understand that we are in this world, but not of this world. What does that mean? That means that there is a a, a different system, a governing system in the heavenly realm, in the atmosphere that is governing, that is is moving things, that is making things happen. And so, so what we see here is the devil uses this system of accountability. He has these principalities like, like Asherah, like, like uh, Sennacherib, these different types of principalities that then have their servants and their, their, their legions of demons that report back. And so the devil's at the top of all of that. And the devil will send out his messengers to do his work, just like Sennacherib here. Sennacherib didn't come out to face the king himself. He didn't come out to face Hezekiah and give the message. He sent his leaders. He sent his officials. And the devil likewise has minions that he uses. He has these little demons that he sends out, but it's all in a system of authority. It's a hierarchy with different positions. And so Sennacherib and um, Asherah, Asherah represent two of the devil's governing principalities. But here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. You will never meet Sennacherib if there is Asherah worship in your life. You'll never have to. You'll never have to deal with this principality. Again, when I, when I use the word Sennacherib, I'm not talking about the person who's now dead and gone, the king of Assyria. I'm talking about the principality that he represents, the spirit that was influencing his decisions, right? Same thing with Asherah. Asherah was, was a name that they gave this deity, this, this, this goddess, but I'm talking about the principalities that they embody, the principalities that they represent. You will never meet Sennacherib, this spirit, 
if there's Asherah worship in your life. And now we talked about Asherah last week. Asherah is okay with coexisting with Yahweh. Asherah is a spirit that is okay with, with being a part of your worship of God. Asherah wants to be involved in your life, but doesn't necessarily want to replace God in your life. It's a coexisting spirit. It's an inclusive, a spirit of inclusivity that says, let's just all worship together. Let's just worship Allah. Let's worship Buddha. Let's worship whoever you want to worship. Let's all do it together in harmony. And ultimately the deceptive nature of that spirit is that it promotes peace, right? Everybody can worship. We can all use the same temple to worship. Let's move some of these pagan shrines and some of these altars of Asherah into the temple. We can all coexist. But the problem is when a system disruptor shows up on the scene, when somebody who says that the Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods, When someone comes in and says, we're going to break down this system of Asherah and kicks out that system and says, no, or that that spirit says, no, we're only going to worship God. Then the devil has to send in this other principality named Sennacherib. And the Sennacherib spirit is the enforcer. This is the intimidator, right? But as long as Asherah is at work in your life, there's no need for Sennacherib. There's no need to make things get hostile. There's no need to, to cause a conflict. Why? 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 Because you are already defeated. If Asherah is in your life and there is worship of other gods, idolatry, and you are coexisting, that spirit is coexisting with God, then you're already defeated internally in the devil. You're no threat to the devil. You're no threat to the enemy. And some may be hearing what I'm saying right now and saying, well, then that's fine. I don't want to be under attack. I don't want to be under siege. I don't want to go through difficulty in this life. Yes, but if Asherah is already in your life, you are already defeated. Your fate is already sealed. If you are worshiping God and other gods, if you have sin in your life, if you have the idol of money and pleasure and and lust and the things of this world governing in your life, even if they are co, so you think, co-governing with God and coexisting with God, you're already defeated. Your life is already open to the enemy. He already has authority to do what he wants to do. And do not think for a moment that if you're not a system disruptor and if you've given place to the spirit Asherah, that the devil's not gonna come for you. The day will come. Listen, his end goal is for you to die and go to hell. That is what the devil wants. He wants you to spend eternity in torment away from God with him and his demons. That is his goal. So whether you fall under the influence of Asherah, the more peaceful, hippie, peace sign, coexisting, let's all be happy together. Whether you fall in that camp or you're a system disruptor who says, no, let's get rid of that. The devil's not gonna stop. He's not gonna stop until you are dead in hell, separated from God. That is his mission. That's what he wants. And so when a system disruptor shows up and says, this Asherah worship, this, this splitting, you know, the, the attention of Yahweh and these other, de- no, this isn't going to work. We get this. Now he's going to amp up, okay, the, the attack a little bit. It's not going to be as easy as it was when Asherah was involved. He's going to send Sennacherib. Sennacherib is, again, the enforcer. He's the intimidator. He's the one who comes in. But both spirits are used for the purpose of negotiation. Why? Because the devil's a master negotiator. That's what we just established. So he uses both spirits, the spirit of Sennacherib, and he uses the spirit of Asherah to negotiate. One employs the tactic, look, one employs the tactic of seduction and the other uses the intimidation factor. But both are negotiators. It's a little bit of good cop, bad cop, right? One says, uh, uh, hey, let's, let's all have a good time. It's that seductress. It's that spirit of lust. It's that spirit of hidden sin. It's that spirit of do things behind closed doors so nobody really sees what's going on. And then the other one comes in after you, you say, no, I'm gonna do what's right before the Lord. I'm gonna serve God with all my heart. Then that other spirit sets in and that's the spirit that is the intimidator. Still has to negotiate, but it's good cop, bad cop. He's gonna come in, that spirit's gonna intimidate, is gonna try and convince you that God is against you, try and convince you that the battle is already lost. So point number three, Sennacherib will try to twist the narrative. And that's another art that the enemy has gotten really good at is twisting the narrative. And that's what he does. 
Look at 2 Kings 18, 22 through 25. And this is where it gets really, hmm, what's the word? The best word to use here. This is where it gets really twisted. I'm just going to use that word. It gets really twisted here. But perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God, right? Because ultimately that's what we do as Christians. We trust in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? What? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? Now, look at how crafty this spirit is. Look at how crafty the devil is. He's trying to convince the people of Judah at that time that God is angry with them. Look at it again, verse 22. But perhaps you'll say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God, Yahweh, the one true king. You may be saying, we're trusting in Jesus. We're trusting God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Look at how the devil twists the narrative. This spirit of, of, of Sennacherib comes in and says, why would God help you? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars? Hezekiah didn't tear down his shrines and altars. Hezekiah tore down the shrines and altars of Asherah, of the pagan gods, of the gods who were taking God's worship. He went in and did the work of God, but here comes this spirit, and it may be tormenting your mind. It may be speaking to you saying, didn't you, why would God defend you? Didn't you do what made him angry? Aren't you, isn't God mad at you to begin with? Why would God defend you? This spirit twists the narrative when Hezekiah had only done what had pleased God up until that point. The Bible says that there had never been another king like Hezekiah. He had done what was pleasing to God to destroy, to destroy the dominion that these principalities had over the kingdom of Judah. So they didn't like that. So they have to twist the narrative. And that's what Sennacherib is doing here. Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and in Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? He hadn't torn down anything that was God's. He had torn down the pagan altars. Verse 23, I'll tell you what, and here's the negotiation. Look, good cop, bad cop, right? Asherah comes in, seductive, nice, happy, let's all coexist. Now here's bad cop, Sennacherib. I'll tell you what, strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many men to ride on them. Even in the offer, he's still slamming them. Even in the offer, he's still insulting them. With your tiny army, how can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops, even, the help, even with the help of Egypt's chariots and charioteers? What's more, do you think we have invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us to attack this land and destroy it. Now, I need to speak to all of the system disruptors for a minute right? Because not everyone is a system disruptor. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, and that's okay too. But I want to talk to all of the system disruptors. Listen to me prophetically today by the Spirit of the Lord. Those of you who have been called with a special purpose from God to do a special mission here on this earth, those of you who have a calling of God on your life to shake up and disrupt systems, you have to hear what I'm going to tell you today. The devil, his greatest tactic and technique is to convince you that God is against you and to convince you that the difficulty that you're facing, the hardship that you are facing, the struggle that you are going through, whatever it is to convince you that that's God's doing. Because those of us who are system disruptors can't be deceived by the devil with a pitchfork and a dark cloak, it won't work on us. We know, we know what the devil looks like. We know what to expect when it comes to the tactics of the enemy. We know how to spot the attack of the enemy. But what this spirit, Sennacherib, this principality is an expert at and what the devil sends him to do is to taunt us in our mind and convince us that God sent him. Look at how vile that is. Look at how evil that is. Look at how twisted that is. Look at verse 25 again, pull it up. What's more, do you think we've invaded your land without the Lord's direction? And because see, that's what we tell ourselves in our minds. God's with me, God's got me. When we hear the tactics of the enemy, when we hear the lying voice of the devil, we, we have to gravitate to something. We have to cling to something. So what we do is we say, no, 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 no. That's not in alignment with the word of God. God's got me, right? 
When the devil attacks, we say, God's got me. But look at what he says here. What's more, do you think we've invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. And that, now that one, that one statement wouldn't work without the previous. Look at the, look at the mastery. Let's study the, study the mastery of his craft here. Verse 25 won't work without verse 22. Look at verse 22 again. Perhaps you will say to me, we are trusting in the Lord our God, but isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? So here, here what this spirit is doing is it's taking a false narrative, but a narrative nonetheless. You've insulted God, right? That's verse 22. Then down in verse 25, therefore God told us to attack you. Come on, you have to appreciate the expertise of the devil here. First, he convinces you that you did something wrong. We talked about that with the spirit of Asherah, right? Last week, the devil always tries to make you feel like you did something wrong. Why? Because if you didn't believe that you did something wrong, then how could you believe that you are deserving of God's quote unquote punishment? And that's what he does. He convinces you, you screwed up and what you're going through now are the results of your mistake. But in this case, for Hezekiah, the system disruptor, he didn't do anything wrong. He had only obeyed and done what God had told him to do. But I have news for those who maybe aren't in the same camp as Hezekiah, who can't say, hey, I really have done what's right before the Lord. Even if you do mess up and you're deserving of Sennacherib's taunting, the grace of Jesus Christ is enough to make you right with God so that you don't have to believe the lie of the enemy. So one way or another, whether you've done what's right before the Lord or you messed up and you're deserving of punishment, you're deserving, all you have to do is say, God, save me. God, forgive me if you've done things that aren't pleasing to him, that aren't in alignment with his word, and he will come to your rescue. But what will never happen is verse 25. What's more, do you think we've invaded the land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us to attack and destroy. That will never happen. That will never happen. Did you hear what I said? That will never happen. God will never give the enemy a directive to destroy you. So if you need, if you need to be able to determine whether it's coming from God or from the enemy, you have to ask, is this for my destruction? If so, it's not from God. God will never issue the command for his children to be destroyed. No, if you are living in a way that is not conducive and not coherent and not in alignment with the word of God, God in his grace will convict you. You will feel the convicting spirit of the Lord come upon you and you will know this is not of God and he will give you the opportunity to rectify what you're doing and change. God is never gonna send the enemy to destroy you when you do something wrong. Now, when we get out of the will of God, and when we live a life voluntarily against God and we turn our back to God, we open ourselves up for the enemy to attack us. That's a different thing here. I'm talking about children of God who are trying to do what's right, who make a mistake. God is going to convict you and bring you back into right standing. But then there are those who turn their backs on God and live in rebellion to God. And those who choose to do that remove the protection of God from off of their life. Okay, so there's two different things here that I do want to differentiate. If you are living for the enemy and have turned your back on God and not trying to do what God has called you to do, you are opening yourself up for the enemy to come in and attack you and ultimately destroy you. Because again, that's the purpose, isn't it? The devil wants to destroy us. So let's use some practical examples of what Hezekiah is dealing with here in today's uh, uh, today's day and age, right? And uh, some examples that maybe those watching or those in the room can relate to. Maybe the devil's told you you were supposed to go to Bible school and instead you went to business school. And now God is ironically causing you to struggle in your finances just to teach you a lesson. That's not God. That's not God. But these are the narratives that the devil will feed us. These are the narratives that that spirit Sennacherib will plant in our minds. See, you didn't do what you were supposed to do God wanted you to go to Bible school. You went to business school anyway, so now he's gonna punish you by making you go through lack and experience difficulty and dry up your resources. That's not God. You weren't supposed to get married so young. How about that one? 
You missed out on the one God really wanted to bring into your life. So now God's going to strain your relationship to teach you a lesson. God's going to make you suffer. God's going to put difficulty in your marriage because you missed the one that he really wanted for you. That's not God. We serve a God of grace. We serve a God whose mercies are new every morning. You had an abortion. How about this one? You had an abortion before you accepted Jesus. And now that you're serving him, you have to raise a sick child so that God can teach you a lesson for having that abortion. That's not God. So any of these narratives, and these are just some examples, any of these thoughts that may have come into your mind, and I don't know what you're dealing with or what your situation is or what the lie of the enemy is in your life, but you have to ask the Holy Spirit, give me discernment. Give me discernment to know if this is you or if this is that spirit of Sennacherib that has been sent to torment me because I'm trying to do what's right before the Lord. I don't know what what the narrative is and what the voice in your head has said, but the voice of God is one of love and grace and mercy and not one of condemnation and torment. God does not delight in your torment. God doesn't delight in your torment. God does not want you to be sick. God does not want you to struggle. God does not want you to face all of these difficulties. So you have to understand, first of all, the nature of God. You have to understand who your God is in order to not fall into the trap and into the lie of the enemy of this spirit of Sennacherib that would try and tell you God is punishing you for something that you did wrong. And in some cases, like I said with Hezekiah, maybe you've done nothing wrong. Maybe you've only tried to do what God told you to do. And in your attempts to be obedient and in your striving to please him and do what's right, the devil has convinced you that somewhere along the way you made a wrong turn. And maybe maybe the devil has even used people who have been people of influence in your life to try and convince you that you did something wrong. And they're trying to tell you God is against you. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to that. You need to ask God, Lord, what are you saying about me? What are you saying about this situation? And God is faithful. He'll show up and he'll, he'll speak to you. As we close today, look at 2 Kings 18, 26 through 36. And we can play the altar music, Delilah. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, um, Shebna and Joah said to the Assyrian chief of staff, please speak to us in Aramaic for we understand it well. Don't speak in Hebrew for the people on the wall will hear. But Sennacherib's chief of staff replied, Do you really think my master sent this message only to you and your master? He wants all the people to hear it. For when he puts this city under siege, they will suffer along with you. Now look, this is, let me pause right there. This is that process that the the, the king of Israel, we talked about last week, went through. He's starting the intimidation process. The same thing Goliath did time, day after day, time after time. He would come to the camp of Israel and wear them down. He would taunt them. He would discourage them by speaking over them. And the devil knows how to speak your language. He knows how to say the things that torment you the most. He knows how to use what hurts the most. And so they, he says, they will be so hungry. Look at this. They will be so hungry and thirsty that they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. Talk about trash talk. Verse 28. Then the chiefs of staff stood and shouted in Hebrew to the people of the wall, listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. Some of us need to stop listening to the spirit of Sennacherib. That's the problem. We're entertaining these spirits. We just need to stop listening. Then the chief of staff stood and shouted in Hebrew to the people of the wall, listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will never be able to rescue you from my power. Don't let him fool you into trusting the Lord by saying the Lord will surely rescue us. This city will never fall into the hands of the Assyrian king. Don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms the king of Assyria is offering. Again, boom, back to the negotiation. Look, it's intimidation, 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 negotiation. Now, I want you to really zero in on that. I want you to focus in on that for a minute. Intimidation, 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 persuasion intimidation, 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 negotiation. Good cop, bad cop. Now look, make peace with me, open the gates and come out. Then each of you can continue eating from your own grapevine and the fig tree and drinking from your own well. Then I will arrange to take you to another land than this one. Again, 
That spirit always wants to relocate you. A land of grain and new wine, bread and vineyards, olive groves and honey. Choose life instead of death. Oh my goodness. This guy's poetic. This guy is like, I could just see him writing a play, right? He's very poetic with it. Choose life instead of death. And that's what that spirit is telling you. Choose life instead of death. That spirit, listen to how uh, twisted the narrative is. I can't even take it. Choose life instead of death. That spirit is trying to convince you that the will of God and what God has planned for your life is death. And that in actuality to follow him and to be relocated and to accept his proposition is life. Ah, oh, it makes me so angry because there are so many people that are falling prey to this spirit. There are so many people that are listening and believing the lie of the devil. Don't let Hezekiah, don't listen to Hezekiah when he tries to mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any other nations ever saved their people from the king of Assyria? I have news for the king of Assyria right now. I'm getting heated even as I just read this. Our God is not like the gods of the other nations. Our God created everything that is. He spoke everything into existence, including the king of Assyria, including the very devil who sends his little principalities and his little minions to try to intimidate us. Look at verse 34. I got to get through this, man. I can't even read this passage because I'm getting so fired up today. Verse 34. What happened to the gods of Hamath and Arpad? And what about, the, what about the gods of Sapphire, Varam, Hena, and Eva? Did any God rescue Samaria from my power? What God of any nation has ever been able to, to save the, uh, its people from my power? So what makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? But the people were silent and did not utter a word because Hezekiah commanded them, do not answer him. That's some good advice. Do not answer him. Don't even pay attention to the enemy when he comes at you like that. But that's what the devil will do. He'll, he'll try and convince you that other things that you've put your trust in equate to God. God is in a class all of his own. Yahweh is not comparable to any other God. And so as I close today, I want to give you my final point. And it is in this point that you will have victory. Your victory is found. This is point number four. Your victory is found in point number two of this sermon. So nobody looking at any notes, what was point number two of my sermon <laughs> today? Today, what was point number two of my sermon? I know you know, because you got it right in front of you. Anybody? Oh my Lord. Point number two of my sermon today is the devil is a master negotiator. So I don't get it. Explain it. Point number four of my sermon, my closing point is, your victory is found in point number two of my sermon. Point number two of my sermon is the devil is a master negotiator. So how is our victory found in that fact? Look at this. The fact that the devil is a master negotiator should make us so happy inside that we should be doing cartwheels right now. Because if he had the power to destroy you, oh, this is so good. I think this is the best point I've had all year. If he had the power to destroy you, he wouldn't have to be so good at negotiating your surrender. Think about that for a moment. The devil is a master negotiator. It is his art. It's what he's perfected. It is what he's worked on for thousands of years because the only power he has is to convince you that he has the power. If he cannot negotiate his way into your surrender, if he cannot negotiate his way into convincing you that he is more powerful, he has no power. The devil cannot destroy you. He has to convince you and negotiate with you until you surrender and say, okay, come and get me. So I want that to become alive to you today. The fact that you are under attack the fact that you are experiencing difficulty, the fact that it's really hard and the battle is really raging is evidence that the devil doesn't have the power to destroy you. Because if he did, he would have already done it. If he did, you'd already be dead by now. But the fact that you're still breathing, the fact that you're still awake right now, the fact that you still hear the sound of my voice means that God still has something left for you to do. It means that God still has a purpose for your life. 
It means that God's not done with you yet. And it means that the devil is scared of what you're going to do for God. So be encouraged today and stop negotiating with the devil. We don't negotiate with terrorists. God's got a plan for your life. And it's not for you to stick a gun to your head and pull that trigger. It's not for you to overdose on drugs. It's not for you to do any of these things. God has a plan for you to tear down the principalities of Sennacherib, to tear down the kingdom of Asherah. God has a plan for you to come in and disrupt the camp of the enemy. And the devil has no say. He has no authority against you. He has no power over you. All he can try to do is intimidate you. In fact, he's so scared of you that he stays in the background and sends his principalities out to deal with you. Why doesn't the devil come out and deal with you himself? He sends his principalities. He sends these lying spirits because he knows that if you will grab a hold of who you are, he knows that if you will get the revelation of what's inside of you, he knows that if you will open up your eyes and see the power that God has given you, he doesn't stand a chance. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would infuse every person listening to this sermon right now with the power that is rightfully theirs, with the authority and the confidence that comes from you. God, in the name of Jesus, I feel in my spirit that you're raising up a generation. You are raising up an army that will stand up against the principalities of darkness that will say, no devil, you're not going to take anyone else to hell. You're not going to take these people by lying and deceiving. We stand stand up and we possess the authority that is ours. And we say no to the spirit of Sennacherib. We don't need you. We say no to the spirit of Asherah. Get out of the temple of God. We say no to every spirit that is contrary to the word of God. And we say, God, we silence the voice of Sennacherib because the only power that he has is his voice. The only power that he has is his voice. And as we will find out in the next Uh, part four of this series the devil has no power other than the power of intimidation and so we say no to it today in the name of Jesus no to it the the attack is evidence of the plan of God for our lives the resistance is evidence of the greatness of what God is going to do in us and through us. So Holy Spirit, fill our minds right now. Silence every tormenting spirit. I speak to every spirit of suicide because that is one of the tactics. That's one of the techniques that the devil uses, this spirit of Sennacherib. When it starts to sense that it's losing ground, listen, when that spirit starts to sense that it's losing power, that spirit of Ashra gets kicked out. And the devil starts getting alerts. Hey, hey, we're we're under attack here. We're losing power. That's when he will start everything he can do to try and convince you to take your own life, to call it quits, to throw in the towel. But we say no to the devil in Jesus' name. Right now, no to the devil in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we say no to the spirit of suicide. We say no to the spirit of drug abuse. We say no to the spirit of sexual immorality. We say no to every spirit of anxiety, to every spirit of the devil that would try and derail us from what God wants for our lives. We say no in the name of Jesus. And we say yes to the Holy Spirit. We say yes to the spirit of truth. Come, spirit of truth, now. Evict every lie out of our minds. Speak peace over our minds, I pray. In the name of Jesus, speak peace over our minds. In the name of Jesus, no more spirit of of insomnia that would rob us of our sleep, of our rest, of our relaxation, of our peace. In the name of Jesus, I speak to that spirit of impending doom and gloom. Something bad's going to happen. I just know it's going to happen. No, I speak to that. I say, get out in Jesus' name. You go. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you have greatness in store for every person under the sound of my voice. And if you're watching right now and you've never made the decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you want to experience the peace that I'm talking about, you want to experience the joy, you want to experience the authority, you want to experience the power to speak to these principalities and say, get out in Jesus' name. I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. And everyone in this room is going to repeat it for the sake of those watching right now. And you're going to make a decision today to turn away from your old life and follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you want to do that today, repeat this simple prayer. It's not about the words that we're going to say. It's about the heart behind the words. So if you mean this from your heart, you will be saved today. 
and you will be set free. Just repeat these uh, simple words after me. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I come humbly right now acknowledging I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I humble myself and I ask you to forgive me. I declare that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived as a man, and died on the cross for my sins. But on the third day, he rose again, victorious over every spirit of the devil, over every principality. And today I claim that victory. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Give me the power I need to live for you here on this earth so that one day I can spend eternity with you in heaven. I accept you now. I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to welcome you today. I want to just say thank you for trusting in, in, in God to be your Lord and Savior. Thank you for joining us on this journey because it is a journey. Even for those of us who have been in it for a long time, we don't have it all figured out, right, guys? We're still learning. We're still growing together, and we certainly will never arrive until one day we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's when the race will be done. That's when the journey will be over. And we will spend eternity with him, worshiping him in paradise. But until that time, we need each other. We need to surround ourselves with other like-minded believers. So if you want to connect with us, if you want to learn more about this, if you just need a support system in your life, please message us at info at circlechurch.online. You can message us on any of our social media platforms. If you need prayer, send us a message on any of our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook. Send us an email. We want to pray with you. We get our team together anytime that we have have a prayer request, we send it out. We pray together for every prayer request that comes in. We love you. We want to support you. We look forward to next week. It's going to be part four of System Disruptor. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be the final, I think, don't hold me to it, but I think it's going to be the final sermon of this series, and it's going to be powerful. We're going to wrap it all together. We're going to see what happened to Hezekiah, right? Right now, he's under attack. Remember that. So we're going to leave it hanging there, and we're going to come back next week. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful week.